facing a catastrophe despite the ceasefire as the conflict risks spilling over beyond its borders. Our other headlines, a massive exodus is turning into a refugee crisis with already more than 100,000 people fleeing the fighting in Sudan. A top Ukrainian army commander says Russian forces have been ousted from some positions in the battleground city of Bakhmut. And real-life Hollywood drama starring the striking scriptwriters in a nail-biting storyline threatening to bring television and film production to a halt. Gunfire and explosions echoed across Sudan's capital Khartoum on Tuesday despite yet another ceasefire. The United Nations has warned that continued conflict could destabilize the entire region of northeast Africa. Sudan's neighbors are bracing for the influx of tens of thousands of refugees as this conflict drags into its third week. Hundreds of people have been killed and thousands injured as the two military groups vie for power. Neighboring countries, including Egypt and South Sudan, have offered to broker peace. Well, let's talk to uh, our correspondent, Naba Moedin, who's in uh, Madani, around 130 kilometers from Khartoum. Um, Naba, what do we know about um, these talks between the army and Egypt? Hi, Jamie. The talks between the army and Egypt are uh, still, there is no uh, clear uh, vision about it or details about it, but uh, confirmed sources said there is meetings between army and uh, Egyptian officials in order to relieve the political and the chaotic situation in the country. Um, we know that Egypt will support any internal uh, Sudanese-Sudanese dialogue in the next coming days, and it will help uh, relieve the situation but we don't know whether it's part of the IGAD or African Leaders um, initiative or it will be part of the UN initiative. But we, are, we, we know that there is close ties and relationship between Sudan and the, and the military, uh, between Sudan's military and the Egyptian uh, government. And that, of course, will add uh, more pressure uh, on the two sides to, uh, to, to accept or to go forward or, in, uh, or any uh, initiative uh, in the next coming days. So there is no further details about the Egyptian meeting with the military, but uh, we know that the, uh, the ties between the two countries, the economic ties, the political ties, and the refugees, uh, a situation right now uh, of hundreds of thousands of Sudanese uh, who fled the war to Egypt, uh, of course, it will uh, make Egypt the closest, uh, the closest neighbor to help relieve the situation in the country. The United Nations has uh, painted a pretty dire picture for refugees from the war. How hard is it to uh, leave Sudan and come to that? How challenging is it to remain in the country? Uh, actually, Jamie, the two uh, options are very hard for anyone to make. Uh, the decision is really hard for anyone. Uh, the, for the people who are staying in the capital, Khartoum, or around the capital, like in Madani or any other state, uh, the biggest problem right now is the services. There is uh, sh uh, water sh out uh, shortages and uh, power outages, a scarcity of food, medicine, uh, collapse of health system. Uh, and of course, above all, is the security situation for the people in Khartoum. There is looting, armed groups. Uh, beside the armed conflict, there is lack uh, of, uh, of uh, police. Uh, there is uh, absence of law and order. So it's really difficult for them. But uh, for people who uh, chose to stay in Khartoum, some of them uh, can't leave the capital for their own uh, mm, reasons, including the unsafe ro uh, road from uh, Khartoum to other uh, places like uh, to Egypt or to Al Jazeera. Some of them, uh, they can't afford the cost of uh, moving from Khartoum. Right now, it's hundreds of uh, of dollars uh, if in order to leave the capital itself uh, one person should uh, at least pay five hundred dollars to one thousand which is really high for Sudanese people um, for people who are staying also uh, the obvious scenarios of what will happen next beside the scarcity of food water medicine uh, the extension of the war uh, spot, uh, if it uh, morphed into uh, civil war or tribal clashes. So the scenarios are open, and it's really hard to, 
uh, to make decision about leaving the country or staying in the country. Naba, thank you for that. Our correspondent, Naba Moadin in uh, Khartoum. Well, the United Nations is warning the violence is having a catastrophic impact on the humanitarian situation in Sudan. The country's health ministry said more than 500 people have been killed and nearly 4,600 injured since fighting started in April. The violence has paralyzed the country's health care system. According to Sudan's doctors' union, there's not a single functioning hospital left in the capital, Khartoum. The fighting has also triggered a severe refugee crisis. The United Nations Migratory Agency says more than 334,000 people have been internally displaced within Sudan and over 100,000 have fled the country. UNHCR, the UN's refugee agency, is estimating that more than 800,000 people could potentially flee to neighboring countries as this conflict continues. Meanwhile, the UN said its 2023 aid appeal for $1.75 billion for Sudan is only 14% funded, leaving $1.5 billion gap. Well, let's talk now to uh, Carl Skembri, who's from the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, Carl, good to see you. Um, welcome. Um, tell us about uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council's operation in Sudan. What are you doing and how extensive is your operation? Well, right now, our, our operations are pretty much at a standstill, uh, except in some safer areas, including where your reporter was just reporting from, in Wad Madani, uh, Gadaref, eastern side of Khartoum. We've managed to reach out to some of the displaced thousands fleeing there. The rest uh, is, is out of bounds uh, for my colleagues, some of them fleeing for their own lives in Khartoum, in Darfur, especially in Janaina, in al Fasher, also in Darfur. It's been a, a nightmare, really, with our uh, colleagues uh, and their families coming under fire, their, the, the uh, aid uh, um, infrastructure, the, the, our facilities have been looted in Darfur, in Janaina. Uh, it's, 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 it's unoperable right now as the fighting rages on, and, and our colleagues are risking their lives uh, would be risking their lives if they had to distribute any kind of aid. Before all this, we were pretty much across all of Sudan, working with the displaced, with the refugees. As you said, uh, just 14 percent of the funding before all this started was was available uh, for the for the response, the humanitarian aid inside Sudan. That's that's before all this started, before 15th of April. From now on, we're back to square one. We need billions more. And we'll need it, it's, it's even it's, it's still being worked out uh, how how bad uh, the, the the aid needed will, will be once there is some kind of peace. Carl, you'll have seen the United Nations uh, warning in the last few hours of uh, what they describe as a humanitarian catastrophe. Based on what your people are telling you and and your experience, um, what is your outlook? I mean the. We're looking at the unthinkable. Uh, no one even thought that the capital city of Sudan would would be end up in this catastrophe. It's it's an apocalyptic scenario. Uh, people, our own colleagues, have been telling me they've destroyed the capital city. It's it's now in ruins, and and it will take months or years even to to be able to resume some kind of normality. What we need right now is a real effort from the international community as big as an effort as they put in evacuating their own citizens in getting the two sides of this conflict to to stop this insanity to allow us to reach the the most vulnerable who need our aid and to give a respite to the millions of civilians who are uh, caught in this insanity um, beyond the hopes for a diplomatic and and swift solution uh, what supplies are running out fastest? Uh, what is your intelligence in terms of uh, food and clean water and medical supplies for those directly affected? For those caught in the fighting, supplies ran out very quickly, especially in the capital, uh, as they were never used to uh, this kind of emergency. So food and water, uh, areas of Khartoum have been completely out of water for more than two weeks now because the, the water station was hit in the very first hours of the fighting. Medical aid, 
medical supplies, not just running out. They've also been massively looted across the country in a very shameful episode of, of attacks on, on civilian supplies. Uh, power uh, is, is on and off in, in, in many areas, mostly off hours on end over 12 hours of blackouts. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty much everything is needed right now. And where things are available, like in Wad Madani, uh, they are extremely overpriced because of their scarcity. So fuel uh, only available on the black market, water and bottled water, drinking water and food, uh, their prices going up day by day as, as they get scarcer and scarcer. Carl, thank you for talking to us. Uh, good luck with your work. That's uh, Carl Skembri from uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council. Thank you. A top Ukrainian army commander says Russian forces have been ousted from some positions in the battleground city of Bakhmut. Ukraine is still holding on to parts of the city after 10 months of fierce fighting against Russian troops and fighters from the Wagner mercenary group. The head of Wagner said its units had made incremental advances in Bakhmut. Well, let's talk to our correspondent Shelby Wilder, who's watching events for us from uh, Kyiv. Um, Shelby, first of all, um, what's the latest you have on the fighting? Well, I'll start by giving an update on the widespread attacks carried out by Russia on Ukraine yesterday. We've heard Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky say that two people have been killed on that strike in the city of Pavlograd in Dnipro in eastern Ukraine. We know that 40 civilians have been wounded, including children. And this came after Russia launched 18 missiles in the early hours of Monday morning at Ukraine. Ukraine's air defense managed to intercept 15 of those missiles. Otherwise, news from the front lines. We've heard Ukraine's military say that they will not give up. The embattled city of Bakhmut in the Donetsk region in the east of Ukraine. Today, the general of Ukraine's ground forces visited Bakhmut and vowed to hold on to that city as Ukraine launches its counteroffensive. He also said that in the meantime, Ukraine's military would continue to inflict maximum damage and losses on Russia's military and also the private military group Wagner. Jamie. In the last few hours, Shelby, we've had this uh, U.S. intelligence report, which has given us something of a, a broad insight into the extent of uh, what are thought to be Russian casualties. Yes, absolutely. So to give some sort of figures and context on the situation, we heard the U.S. Uh, this week claim that not only has Russia's winter offensive in their eyes failed, but it's also led to 100,000 casualties. White House spokesperson John Kirby said that Russia had suffered over 20,000 deaths with its soldiers and 80,000 wounded just since December, so within five months of fighting. Kirby added that more than half of these deaths were attributed to the private military group Wagner. As we know, Wagner has frequently sent in its mercenaries with little to no training or leadership. And Kirby added that the majority of these casualties were in the Donetsk region where Bakhmut is located. And we have followed for quite some time the really just bloody and intense battles that have been happening there with uh, close range combat, street fighting, trench warfare. And Russia, along with the Wagner mercenary group, continues to claim that they're on the brink of capturing that city. They have said that for many, many months, although they have not managed to do so. And with Ukraine's ground forces saying today um, they are holding on to that city, they are in the western edge of Bakhmut. But we'll continue to see how this develops as we await Ukraine's counteroffensive to begin at any time now. Jamie. Shelby, thank you for that. Our correspondent Shelby Wilder in Ukraine. Well, Russia's defense minister has called for high-precision missile output to be doubled as soon as possible. Sergei Shorgu said defense enterprises have been told to rapidly increase production. He went on to say that weapons production and arms supply to the front line is crucial to military success for Moscow. Meanwhile, a top United Nations trade official is expected to travel to Moscow amid a diplomatic push to ensure a deal is renewed, allowing for the safe export of Ukrainian grain from Black Sea ports. 
Talks are reportedly scheduled for Wednesday. Russia has repeatedly said it will not allow this deal to continue beyond the 18th of May unless the West removes obstacles to Russian grain and fertilizer exports. A Palestinian man has died in Israeli custody after an 87-day hunger strike. Kader Adnan, a senior leader of the Islamic Jihad group, had been awaiting trial on terrorism charges. Israeli authorities say Adnan was found unconscious in his cell and declared dead after efforts to revive him failed. Israel maintains Adnan had refused medical treatment, although his lawyer says care was withheld. Adnan is the first Palestinian to die on hunger strike since 1992. The self-proclaimed Kenyan pastor Paul McKenzie has appeared in court accused of inciting cult followers to starve to death in order to meet Jesus. McKenzie faces charges including murder, kidnapping and cruelty to children following the deaths of more than a hundred people. Their bodies showing signs of starvation and asphyxiation were found in around 30 shallow graves on his land where a search is continuing. Nearly 300 people have been arrested and dozens of police officers injured after rioting broke out during May Day protests in France. Many French people opposed the government's pension reforms and hundreds of thousands of demonstrators took to the streets to vent their anger after President Macron raised the retirement age from 62 to 64 despite months of strikes. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. All aboard, before she sets sail, join us for a tour of China's first domestically built cruise liner. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos and unicorn companies. Make sense of it all with global business only on CGTS. There's a new agenda for a new world, accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work, travel, and connect how we think interact and develop it's a new reality a new agenda with me juliet mann <laughs> Hello, welcome back. A reminder of our top stories. The United Nations warns Sudan is facing a catastrophe despite the ceasefire as the conflict risks spilling over beyond its borders. A massive exodus is turning into a refugee crisis with already more than 100,000 people fleeing the fighting in Sudan. Our other headlines, a top Ukrainian army commander says Russian forces have been ousted from some positions in the battleground city of Bakhmut. Hollywood screenwriters are striking for the first time since 2007 after failing to reach a deal with the big studios. The Writers Guild of America has talked for six weeks with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, a group representing most major studios and streaming services. But contract negotiations broke down on Monday. Uh, let's talk to our star of New York, our correspondent John Terrett. Um, what are they asking for then? What are the writers' <laughs> demands? <laughs> yes. Uh, I've always felt I should be in Hollywood, you know.
No, not here, but anyway, it's too late for me. No, I tell you that both sides are very, very far apart. This ain't going to end in the next week, at least I don't think it is. Back in 2007, when this last happened, the fight was about their work getting onto DVDs. Remember DVDs? And even iTunes, if you remember in 2007, iTunes was relatively new and they were just beginning to put TV shows on it. This time round, the fight is about artificial intelligence. On the day, by the way, that IBM has announced it's not not going to hire 7,800 workers in the future and replace those jobs by AI. It's actually today's news here in North America. So the screenwriters are fighting to stop that happening to them and also to do with streaming. Now, this is mainly about TV shows. And here's what happens. Writers who work in Hollywood get green envelopes every so often. In those green envelopes are the residuals, as they're known. This is fees for programs that have run after the main program has finished its run. So it might start on a big network, but then end up on a cable network, and the fees they get are called residuals. Also, the runs are shorter these days, and they're also being asked increasingly to work in mini writers' rooms alongside the main writers who are being paid in the hope that their free work might make it on and that they might end up getting paid. They want an end to that as well. Now, the writers are gig workers. That's the thing to remember. They don't have staff jobs. Most of them don't have staff jobs. Most of them don't even have contracts. They just go from show to show to show. And they have a very powerful trade union backing them, as we are now seeing. Now, the union is calling for $400 million to be paid by the studios to make up for all of this. The studios are offering $6 million. So you can see, Jamie, just how far apart they are. John, how do you think this is going to uh, play out? Well, it's happening already. There are 11,000 members of this union, and the picket lines are forming here in New York already, outside the major the TV stations and the major theatres and things that carry TV production. Not in Hollywood yet, because it's only just after 7 in the morning there. The 2007 strike lasted for 100 days. Hollywood was shut down for that long. The CEO of Netflix has told his investors prepare for a long strike. They have plenty of scripts in backlog, which they can turn to. So do the Hollywood studios. So what will be the early signs? Well, in America, we have a, a tradition going back years and years of late-night TV comedy. And those programs air on all the major networks, and they're all either live or recorded just before transmission. And the jokes are all written by union writers. So one of the first things you'll notice is that these programs, if you see them overseas and you can see them overseas, will suddenly become a lot less topical for the duration of the strike. That'll be the first sign. Jamie? John, thanks for that. Our correspondent, John Terrace, in New York. And let's stay in the United States because uh, six people have been killed and more than two dozen injured in a mass car pileup in the U.S. state of Illinois. A severe dust storm reduced visibility to zero, causing dozens of vehicles to crash on a highway. More than 30 people were taken to hospitals in the area. The police say their injuries range from minor to life-threatening. Japan is introducing its first laws against uh, taking sexually exploitative photographs or videos of others without consent. The bill, which is expected to be passed in June, will prohibit upskirting and secret filming of sexual acts. It's all part of a wider overhaul of Japan's laws on sex crimes, which will also expand the definition of rape. Australia has announced a ban on recreational vaping as it tries to stem nicotine addiction among teenagers. The new rules include the introduction of minimum quality standards and also restricting vape sales to pharmacies. This move is seen as part of the wider crackdown on the tobacco industry. Large cruise liners are regarded as one of the most challenging vessels to build because of their complexity and high standards. And after three years of construction, China's first homegrown cruise liner is scheduled for delivery this year. Our correspondent Wu Bin has been on board following an engineer working on final fit-out before sailing. This is Adora, China's first domestically built cruise liner. Weighing over 130,000 tons, it's the largest passenger vessel that China ever built. Now it's sitting quietly in the northeast tip of Shanghai and almost ready to sail. Enormous efforts has gone into the construction of the ship. The liner has 25 million components, double the number needed for building an aircraft carrier. 
Ma Ling is one of the few female engineers in China's shipbuilding industry. She and her team are now working on the testing of the ship to make sure every function is running normally when sailing in the ocean. But as someone who's been working in this industry for over 20 years, to make this ship alive is nothing like any previous vessels. In the past, we may only need 30 to 60 people to do the testing job. But for this ship, we still feel a bit short-handed, even if we have 300 people. What's making the testing job so difficult is not only the size, but also the high standards for both comfort and energy efficiency. For example, the air conditioning will automatically stop once you open the door to the balcony. Now the ship is about to be delivered this year, and the final preparations are in full swing. The factory has an average of 3,500 workers on the ship per day. At the beginning of June, the ship will leave the dock, which is a key stage. Then we will conduct a mooring test for about one and a half month, mainly for first trial in mid or late July. And then there will be a second trial run afterwards. For the entire team, the days during the trial run will be sleepless, but they all look forward to the day when Adora sails the oceans. It's such a large ship. By the time it leaves the dock, sails on the Yangtze River and finally goes out to the high seas. And if there are other ships passing by, it will be a very spectacular scene. To all the workers who have been dedicated to the first cruise liner, the construction has provided a lot of experience, making the entire industry chain more complete. And now, China's second cruise liner is also on its way. Wu Bin, CGTN, Shanghai. The headlines again. The United Nations warns Sudan is facing a catastrophe despite yet another ceasefire as the conflict risks spilling over far beyond its borders. Massive exodus is turning into a refugee crisis with already more than 100,000 people fleeing the fighting in Sudan. One other story for you, a top Ukrainian army commander says Russian forces have been ousted from some positions in the battleground city of Bakhmut. And that is The World Today. Thank you for watching. There's more news on CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app or scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. We're back with more news at the top of this hour. Coming up next, it's World Insight. For now, from all of the team in London, it's goodbye.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. On today's World Insight, we speak to German Taoist Liu Chengyong. He discusses how he was 